I'm Scott. And today we'll be talking about all the plants and all of the care and stuff we did for this tank right here. That's exactly right. We've had so many wonderful comments and great feedback about our dark frog vivarium here. And Jamie 10 asked for a list of all the plants. So we're actually going to go through the whole system in detail to make sure everybody understands every bit, right? Yes. Let's get into it. So here is an overview of our whole dark frog tank. So this tank is a 20 tall and you can get it for 20 to 30 dollars. Yep, that's right. It's just a simple, simple Equion 20 gallon tank. You can use it for anything. They're cheap, easy to find, and uh, they work awesome. So just to warn you, it's not 20 long. If you see a tank that's longer than this, that's a 20 long. This is Lucius's tank. Just one's longer and one's taller. Yep, that's right. We went with the taller one on this one because we wanted room for the plants to grow. And if we're being honest, we already had it. Yes. Yeah, so it's a good as re re good of a la, 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 la. let's try that again. Blah, 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 blah. Good as a reason as you can ever find to use something, and right? Also, we've used this many times. Um, we've used it for gnolls, goldfish, many things. Yeah, it had a gnolls in it, it had goldfish in it, it had a community planted aquarium at one point, and now it is a frog central. Yes. It is the frog hotel. So um, let's start with describing the system from top to bottom because we've gotten lots of requests about how we've been doing this and that will kind of hopefully help people understand at least our approach and we'd love to hear comments about what you think um, might work better, what you do. We'd uh, love to see pictures of your uh, enclosures as well, right? Yeah. So let's get into it. So first and foremost, because this is a tropical moist environment and we spritz it with deionized water on a regular basis, this is that thing, water. yep, exactly. It's just distilled water from the store, right? Um, <clears throat> you need to have a drainage layer. So you can see on the right hand side here, and I'll put a little arrow right here, that there is a pond, and that shows you what the water level is in the entire enclosure. All of the soil sits above that water level, so it does not get soggy and gross. Yes. Right, Dosha? Another important thing is that the frogs, just in case if the thing the humidity stops, they can go in the pond to stay humid and not dry out. That's exactly right. So frogs get their moisture. They don't drink, okay? And most amphibians don't drink. I know, Petunia's taking a bath right now. They actually get their moisture through their skin. Now, dart frogs in particular, because they're from the Amazon and parts of Central America, the humid rainforest climates need humidity that's like 80 to 100 percent pretty much all the time they can dip below once in a while but they really need to have super high humidity okay yes. so to be able to do that and we'll talk about a couple of secrets but a big thing is to make sure that there's water raining down on them just like rainforest rain showers right Sosha? yes um on a regular basis so we spritz them with a spray bottle and make sure that they stay wet now that water will cycle through everything and then collect in that water layer on the bottom now, if you look over here on the left-hand side, you'll see some squares. This is an egg crate false bottom that I made, which is essentially just a platform made from a plastic egg crate material you can buy from Home Depot, right? Mm -hmm. So we just cut out strips and made the sides and the top, and then we covered it, covered it in nylon screen mesh that you can buy at any hardware store. Yes. And it's important to use nylon because it doesn't corrode or anything like that in the water. It's just plastic. And it just sits there forever, right? It divides the two different layers so they don't mix. That's exactly right. And the soil sits on top. Now all that gravel you see around the sides, I actually intentionally made the false bottom a little smaller than the bottom of the tank and then wrapped the mesh all the way around it so that we could put the gravel on the sides and have it have a little bit of a nicer look. Now the section where you see the egg crate on the left, I did as a secondary way to be able to visually see how much water is in the enclosure. Yes. So it's a little window, if you will. Now above that screen, we have our soil mix. Yes. And now that soil mix is a very typical take on an ABG mix. We were inspired by Tanner from Serpa Design, which is just, he is the best mm -hmm. at this thing. So we take a lot of uh, tips from him and that's a mix of orchid bark, coconut fiber, or sometimes called coconut core, uh, sphagnum moss, and a little bit of sand. And it's a high drainage, 
soil that you can spritz with water and the water sort of trickles through and ends up in the water, doesn't it, Zosh? It's great to use. Yep, it's worked beautifully. And lots of plants love growing on it too. That's exactly right. Now above the soil, what do we have sitting there? What, what's all that sitting above the soil? Magnolia leaves. Exactly. It's our leaf litter. Yep, leaf litter. So the dart frogs come from the rainforest, right? Yes. And they actually, not like you would think maybe a bullfrog that hangs out in a lake or water their whole lives, they don't. They actually will occasionally visit puddles and things like that to breed and to rehydrate, but they live at the base of trees in leaf litter. So that keeps the soil off their skin and it helps feed the springtails and isopods, right? Yes. Which are little invertebrates that we added to help process all the waste. Well, there's Petunia climbing right now. Yep, there's Petunia. Spider frog, spider, spider frog, frog, does whatever a spider frog does. So that is sort of the hardware section. Now, Zosha, let me ask you, do we have any heaters on this aquarium? Yes, no. No, we don't, not no. on this one. We have oh, heaters yeah. on all the rest of them. Yeah, that gets We have a heater on Lucius, but on this one, is there a heater? No. No. Why is that? The frogs like the temperature at 60, right? Yeah, they like it um, between 65 on the low end to about 77, 78 on the high end. So but heating up is like making our house temperature, which is that. Yeah, it's, it's the temperature that most of us live, and that's one of the really super cool things about dart frogs, isn't it? It's so easy to care for. Exactly. You don't have to add additional heat. In fact, if you get much above 80 to 85, that can actually kill a lot of species of dart frogs. So yes. this is not heated, this entire enclosure, um, and it works beautifully. So we're going to change angles here, and let's take a closer look at the plants that we had a special request for. Okay, so let's start from the left to the right and then move from the bottom to the top. How's that sound, Zosha? Okay. Okay, so all the plants we used. Okay, so um, this palm tree looking plant over to the left is actually called... I know. Uh, what is it called? A parlor palm. A parlor palm. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you to the test, Zosha. Can you give us the Latin name? It's, I, yeah, and you, the truth is, is I can't really do it either, but we're gonna try. This is a Chamelia Doria elegans, or also called a parlor palm. You can find them at any garden center. And they're and beautiful. And they work really well, and they never get too huge, which makes them a really good thing. Now, this little leafy guy in front of it with these, these round, fleshy leaves that sit right in front of it, leaning on the, um, the large rock, we have no idea what that is, do we? No, we don't. <laughs> no, we made a plant order when we set this up and there were some delays in the shipping and the company that sent us some of the plants uh, to kind of make good uh, for their customers sent us a bonus plant, which is that guy. And um, we have the slightest idea what it is. So leave us a comment yes, if, if, if you, you can know, identify please that plant. Tell us. Because we have no idea what it is, but it looks nice. Yeah, it looks great. And it? the froggies like it, so well, rock yeah. and roll, right? They love like jumping on it. <laughs> okay, so now if you go over to the right, still growing out of the bottom, you see those stalks growing out of the bottom here. And again, we'll put an arrow so you can see it. That is actually an aquarium plant. Yeah. That is a Bacopa carolinia, um, which is clippings that I actually took from our planted aquarium. You can buy them at most aquarium stores. But the truth is, behind a lot of aquarium plants, and you'll see some of these in are in here are that, um, most aquarium plants, I'm not gonna say most, a lot of aquarium plants can grow um, immersed, which means only partially in water. And because this is a very wet environment, they do beautifully without actually being in the aquarium. Yeah. Right? And there's Petunia modeling off to us. Exactly. Petunia's up front uh, being a glory hound like, like she normally is. And Vernon just hiding as he's yep. like Now that bunch of light green behind Petunia there, that is actually called a nerve plant. Um, very, and I'm going to take bright. a shot at the Latin name here. You ready for this? Wait, let me see. Fetonia. Vershuffleti. Vertonia vershuffleti? Vershuffleti. Vershuffleti. Anyway, your guess is as good as mine, but that is commonly called a nerve plant, and they're found in any garden center, and you can usually find them for little indoor house plants, what you would use for like a fairy garden or a terrarium, Wait, right? Let me try this. Vertonia vershuffleti. Vershuffleti, right? <laughs> That's the one. Um, but that's actually um, pretty awesome stuff and it's done well. Now I will say it's gotten a bit pale in here and I have a feeling that it's probably 
going to be um, that it's probably a little moist for it, but it is certainly doing well. Do you like it? And you can see Petunia is totally digging it. Now all that moss growing up the side as we move to the right, that is actually weeping moss, which is another thing that's traditionally sold for aquariums that has adapted very well to the moist environment oh, of the vivarium. Very well, it's climbing up the side. And it's all growing over the all back, over the place. the water, it's beautiful. Exactly, it's all over the place, it's growing beautifully, it's super low maintenance, we love it. Now, the viney looking stuff growing all the way to the right hand side, um, that's kind of growing in the water and out the water and up that right hand side, and it's actually beginning to creep up the back as well. Ooh, that is also an aquarium plant. Um, and that's actually hydrocodical, oh, excuse me, hydrocodal trip, tripatia Japan. I, this is my favorite plant in the tank because it's just doing so well. It just looks like an ivy, doesn't it? Okay. Which is super cool. But yeah, the hydrocodal Japan is what they'll normally call it in aquarium trade. And again, came out of our aquarium. We were growing it underwater, and I took a couple of small clippings, and away it went. Wow, it went well. Now, if you look in the pond section, underneath some of the Japan that's growing, there's actually another plant, which is an Anubius nana petite. And Zosha, tell me, is that an aquarium plant normally? Yes. Sure is, another aquarium plant. It's growing beautifully as well in an immersed form. Now, that one has its rhizome, which is sort of the main part of the plant that the plant grows from, submerged in the water. It is an epiphyte, it doesn't have roots, so it's getting its nutrients from the moisture on the rocks, and frankly, frog poop. Yep. It's eating frog poop, and it loves it. So hey, as long as one thing loves frog poop, we're in good shape. Now, all the way to the right, as you move towards the back, those stalks growing up, that's just commonly called an arrow plant. You can find them, I don't have the Latin name, but you can find them in literally every garden center or hardware store across the country for indoor plants. Um, they get pretty big, so we actually trim out some of the biggest pieces mm -hmm. um, to leave la enough light to get down to the other stuff. And it just gives, I think, the vivarium better scale, right? Yes. Absolutely. Now, Zosha, can you tell us what kind of ferns we have? That's rabbit foot fern, and I think this one is my second favorite because I just love the name. Rabbit it is foot. totally cool. Now, Zosha, why don't you tell everybody why those ferns are called rabbit's foot ferns? Well, if you look at it, you see those little tips of it? That's not like a little Those foot. fuzzy root looking things? Yeah, they look like a little rabbit foot. Yep, they can look like a rabbit's feet. They're kind of fuzzy and soft, and they sort of drape down, which makes them really, really super cool. Now we have those ferns growing out of little pots of soil that were built into the background. Now the fern that you see growing off to the, or excuse, sorry, not fern, but the other thing that looks like ivy growing off to the left and growing off to the right, that is actually um, ficus pumula, which is just a creeping fig. And it's another really popular fairy garden plant, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So Zosha, I'm pretty sure mommy has that growing up in her fairy garden. Oh yeah, she does. As a matter of fact, it's secret, I think that might be where I got it. Oh, no, it's still a sign from her. <gasps> dun, dun, dun! Hopefully she doesn't watch this part. But nevertheless, that's what that is. Oh, you know what? I just realized, Zosha, I forgot one of the plants on the bottom. If you look carefully, you see some uh, like needle-shaped leaves or sort of almond-shaped leaves growing out in little clumps on the bottom. And we'll put an arrow so you can see it. That is another aquarium plant that we took out of our planted aquarium and started growing in our vivarium. And that is actually a cryptocrine windy, windy red. So it's uh, they're commonly just referred to as crypts. They're a low light, low maintenance aquarium plant that also, you guessed it, can grow immersed. Yes. So and it works nice beautifully it. because of the humidity in here. It's just working great. Now we also have two bromeliads in here. Now, uh, Zosha, are bromeliads plants that grow with roots, or are they epiphytes? They are epiphytes! That's right, and um, what is an epiphyte? What does that mean? Um, they grow in the air, or like they don't need... Like, well, they grow on the surface yes. of something else. They don't have roots that go into the soil, and they don't feed through their roots, like uh, a tree would, or grass, or you know, plants that you have in your front garden, right? They actually get their nutrients from water, um, that's just raining on them and the nutrients that sort of runs down onto their tissues from the surfaces. So frog poop gets rain on it, rain carries that nutrients down, it settles on the plant, the plant can actually use it, use it that way, right? So we have two kinds of um, bromeliads in here. 
The one that's up highest is actually a true bromeliad, and then I'm gonna try the Latin name here. Forgive me for not uh, being awesome Wait. with the Latin names, but honestly, nobody is. Okay, Zosha, you try it first. <laughs> it's a Neo Regilia SP, and I couldn't tell you what SP stands for, but Special. it is a bromeliad, and you can actually see over to the left of it, there's actually a pup. So the way they reproduce, they don't have seeds like normal animals, they send off a shoot and then a new bromeliad starts to grow. So we actually have a pup growing as well, which is totally rad. And now the really bright, brilliant red one that's down lower is a uh, Earth Star bromeliad, and that's it's what they call a terrestrial so bromeliad. Pretty. So it is still a bromeliad, it is still an epiphyte, but it actually grows in soil, doesn't it? Yeah, so it's kind of breaking the but rules. But it doesn't feed from the soil. It's breaking the rules. Exactly, it's a rule breaker, it's a rebel. <gasps> so we can totally respect that, I can totally dig that. Yeah. But that's all the plants that we have in there. We have the magnolia leaves, everything growing, and it's doing beautifully. And the only thing feeding them is the spritzing that we do once a day. Basically, the frogs get a rain shower once a day, and then their poop goes down into the soil. The springtails and isopods process the poop along with the leaf litter and other stuff, and that creates nutrients and the plants grow. Yes. Okay, so now let's get into the equipment and how we're running this thing. So we said before, what size is this? 20 gallon tank. Yep, it's just a 20 gallon high sitting on a normal stand, no big deal, a couple of fly cultures and the spritz bottle underneath, a power strip and a timer. No biggie, right? You said all like really fast. So because these guys are so low maintenance and they don't need any heat or anything else, there's almost no equipment running on this. Yes, yeah, well down here you can notice. Right? It. There's no flow through the water, it doesn't need it, the plants are using the nutrients and there's plenty of nitrifying bacteria processing ammonia and things like that. Everything is running on its own as far as that's concerned, except for a couple of few key items that I want to show you. Well, so, right here yep. is the fan. Exactly. That fan is just a little tiny computer fan that hooks up to a USB charger, actually. So it's just a little low power fan. You can get them for like 12 of them for like $20 on Amazon. And I've got it glued to a suction cup so it sticks to the top and it comes on for about two hours a day, an hour in the morning and an hour at night. And that's just the kind of force the air to flow around and make sure that the air doesn't get stagnant, right? Yes. Now, the light, Zosha, why don't you go ahead and lift up the light so everybody can see the bulbs. So go ahead ready and rotate brightness. that up. Yep, ready for some brightness? Do it up. Oh. All right, so this is just a, a really basic exoterra um, hood with three daylight colored LED bulbs. That's it. It's very bright. That's all that is, and it works beautifully and it was cheap, and you could honestly use almost any light. You could even use like an LED shop light, couldn't you? We're also looking for a, a new lamp that's not as bulky. Yeah, one's a little thinner. We'll probably move to LEDs at some point, but that's really all that is. Now we have the tank covered with a glass aquarium lid. Okay, you can see that there. And that actually helps seal in all the moisture. Now behind the aquarium lid, you can see back here, that I've got screen in this area right here, okay? There's little sections of screen, and you, you can actually see where I had screen all the way across, and I actually put this piece of plastic here because we were lowering the humidity too much. That was too much ventilation, right? Mm -hmm. So we experimented and put a little bit more and more of covering up the screen until we got to the perfect mix. So that fan that's stuck right there in the inside of the glass is pulling air from here and into the tank for two hours a day and beyond that, we keep a consistent, with a single spray per day, a consistent 85 to 90% humidity, don't we? And just a feeding of fruit flies. Yeah, and just a little bit of fruit flies. And that is the equipment. Now the light is on a timer. I'm a big, 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 big fan of putting lights on timers. Why is that, Zosha? Well, it's so that things don't have too much algae growing or extra like light that is not needed. Yep, and how about the animals? How do the animals benefit from that? Well, they have like a, a day light uh, cycle. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So these guys come from the tropics, don't they? Mm -hmm. And how long is it light and how long is it dark near the equator? Do you know? No. <laughs> no, that's okay. As you get to the equator, every day is 12 hours. 
and every night is about 12 hours on the equator. Now, the further away from it you get, it varies a little bit, mm -hmm. and it doesn't change from season to season like it does when you're further away from the uh, equator, like some of our northern states. Yes. So if you know, like during the winter, our days are really short and our nights are really long, and during the summer, our days are really long and the nights get shorter, don't they? But yeah. on the equator, it's basically equal. equal. Equator, that's what it means. So we have this on a 12 hour light cycle on the timers underneath, and the fan is on a, a timer, and we literally don't do anything. So Zosha, why don't you talk about what we do on a day-to-day -to, -day to take care of this? Okay, so. It's really easy. Hello guys, well we already sprayed them. Yeah, we already sprayed them once, but, but like, we give them a spray once a day, right? Yeah, so you spray them. Do, 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 do. And we feed them what? We pull out our fruit flies, and we want to do the culture that is older. So this one right here is from February versus March. Yep. And look how many flies are, flies are still Yeah, left. go ahead and hold that still so we can see all the flies in there. It's crazy see, how many See them all going around in there? Yes. And this is just simple, simple, simple stuff. So we bought a fruit fly culture when we bought these frogs, didn't we? And well... And we're still going on the same culture. I spent $4 on it. $4 can feed a frog. Exactly. We life. got some cups super cheap online. We went online and found a fruit fruit. Fruit fly culture medium. Fruit fly. And, and we found with two frogs that if we start a culture, one culture every three weeks, we have more than enough flies. We yes. actually have some extras. So this guy right here. Yep, that's about three weeks old and we're about to start using it. You can see that one's kicking and we're actually just starting a new one today. I know, it's and crazy. And you mix up some of the, the medium on the bottom. You put some of that uh, excelsior, which is that cooled up stuff so they have somewhere to crawl. You throw some flies in, cap it, date it, and then we sprinkle it in um, once a day, right? So one thing to note, um, that you can get flightless fruit flies. You want to get those so they don't fly around your house, but they do sure. jump so high. Yeah, they do. They, they're flightless, but they happen to be good jumpers. They were so, like, pow! So, <laughs> so you got to get used to that, but we sprinkle them with some special um, frog... Uh, is supplements, vitamin supplements and mineral supplements that they need because their fruit flies um, are not like a complete diet for them, if you will. Yes. So we supplement with this dust. So you put them in a little cup that we have down there. You put some dust in there. You throw some fruit flies in. You give a shake, shake, shake. shake dump them in shake, once a day. Shake. They're getting, these two are probably getting 50 flies per day mm -hmm. between the two of them. And then and they poop a lot. That's it. And they poop a lot. Oh, look how big that poop is. And it is the easiest, most rewarding, fantastic hobby. If anybody is thinking about getting into doing dart frogs, we cannot recommend it enough. It is so fun, it is so easy, and we love these guys. So, that is the rundown. So I hope you enjoyed our deep into the dart frog tank, and hope you learned something. And thank you, Jamie Ten, for requesting about the plants. We love requests. We love comments. Thank you, everybody, for your support. But that is the lowdown on how we're doing our dart frogs. Now, we are planning on using this nook and building a big vivarium. Yes, so look out for that. Lots more stuff. And we will either do, well, we're debating between two things, aren't we? We're thinking about either doing one big vivarium or two, or two that fit types. in that space for two different kinds of frogs because they couldn't, they shouldn't cohabitate. There's a territoriality thing. Also, um, comment down below what type of frog we should do. Yeah, if we do more frogs, we'd love to have some suggestions of some cool frogs to try. But again, we recommend anybody who has the interest, give dart frogs a try. It's super, super easy and it's so much fun, isn't it? Okay. We love our froggies, so thank you. Make sure to like and subscribe, share this video with a friend and we'll catch you next time. So subscribe to learn more stuff and content and get notifications on these, um, go to our Instagram and like this video. This kid knows what we're doing, right? Five yeah. it. Let's do this. Come on. This time hit, hit the hand. <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> hey, we did it. Woohoo! Thank you so much, everybody. We'll catch you next time.